Hey brother! Man, one of the video ideas I've had just rolling around in my head for like the past three, maybe four years is just to fully explain the Disney Renaissance. We've talked about it in bits and pieces over the years and you probably have a pretty good idea of when it happened and what movies are included in it. For the most part though, I think people just think of it as a series of animated hits by Disney in the 90s. Failing to recognize why it started, why it ended, and why it's more than just a series of good movies in a row. Why it was really more of a movement and indeed a renaissance and how these movies are connected in a lot of different ways. And no, I don't mean in some big universe Pixar theory kind of way, but more in terms of theme and style and scope. Today, we explain the Disney Renaissance. <laughs> Okay, so what even is it? The Disney Renaissance refers to the years 1989 through 1999 and the animated movies Disney created at that time. There were 10 in total, including and in order, The Little Mermaid, The Rescuers Down Under, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, The Lion King, Pocahontas, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Hercules, Mulan, and Tarzan. And if I had to bet, I'd say you've probably heard of at least nine of those. The Rescuers Down Well, huh? It's actually really good. Anyway, even if you don't know what it is, I'm sure you've heard the phrase Disney Renaissance before, and if you've ever thought like, wow, that's a pretty generous sounding title, Disney, well, I have to say, for a while I kind of agreed. But it's actually not just a bunch of self-important tough <laughs> renaissance. Ugh. Renaissance is actually a very appropriate title because prior to that, Disney had been going through its own dark age for some 20 plus years. In fact, the animation department itself was at risk of just going under. Which probably sounds crazy, right? I mean, Disney being the entertainment behemoth that it is today, owning Pixar and Marvel and Star Wars and a whole host of other things you were probably unaware of. Like, how could they have ever been on hard times? But back in the 70s and 80s, that was exactly the case. See, in terms of animated movies, Walt Disney himself literally invented the game. The first full-length animated movie ever was Snow White in 1938, and it unwittingly set the tone for so much of Disney's future. It was the first fairy tale movie they did, which is of course what they would eventually go on to be famous for. It was the first princess, there was singing, there was an overly dramatic villain. I mean, I know it feels obvious, but at the time they didn't know what was gonna work and that is a lot to get right just on your first try. And they didn't slow down, churning out other classics like Pinocchio, Fantasia, Dumbo, and Bambi, all making up what is known as the golden age of Disney. From there, the World War II started happening and so in general there was just a lot less money going around for things like animated movies. Not that they didn't make some, but I just have a hard time believing that you've ever heard of or even seen any of these. I mean, I know I personally have not. But then post-war would launch the Silver Age of Disney with classics like Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, Lady and the Tramp, and Alice in Wonderland, among a host of others. Big budget animation was back in full swing and things looked great, but then Walt himself died and the last movie he ever worked on, The Jungle Book, would end the Silver Age and begin the Bronze Age. Or if you prefer and you want to be a little bit more dramatic, some people also call it the Dark Age. Now don't be misled, just calling it the Dark Age doesn't mean that these are bad movies. I'm sure you have some of your very own favorites from this group. And I know I personally do. Great Mouse Detective. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's awesome. But Disney was just struggling to find its way without Walt. There's no songs, no princesses, no fairy tales. They're just throwing stuff at the wall and hoping it would stick. And in the meantime, suffering some pretty massive personnel losses. Namely, a guy named Don Bluth, a Disney animator who left Disney and took with him about 20% of the other animators at Disney to found his own company, Don Bluth Productions. And they immediately started churning out heavy competition in the form of The Secret of Nim, An American Tale, and The Land Before Time, all of which beat their Disney competition at the box office. Meanwhile, back at Disney, they released a film called The Black Cauldron, which cost them $44 million to make and 
only earned back 21. That is a loss of $23 million, and it put the future of the animation department at Disney in jeopardy. But then came The Little Mermaid, directed by John Musker and Ron Clemens. These two had recently worked together on The Great Mouse Detective, which ended up making enough money to save the studio, and it was immediately succeeded by Oliver and Company, the studio's most successful film in over a decade. But that brings us back to The Little Mermaid, which Walt Disney Studio chief Jeffrey Katzenberg was convinced wasn't going to do that well at the box office because it was a girl movie. But oh my gosh, was he wrong because The Little Mermaid changed everything. Bringing in $84 million domestic, Disney finally found their formula and it took off. Clements and Musker designed The Little Mermaid to feel like a Broadway musical, with its huge musical numbers being the tent poles of the whole story. They also reintroduced the princess trope and put her in the ocean, which by its very nature gives you an immense sense of scale. And all of these things would go on to be trademarks of the Disney Renaissance. So now let's talk about the movies themselves and all the cool different ways they are connected, starting with scale. Unlike their predecessors, the Renaissance movies make sure you know the size and scope of the adventure about to happen early and often. And they do this by establishing massive worlds for the characters to exist in. And giving you such a vast space accomplishes quite a bit of things all at once. It lets you know how far reaching the decisions of all of the characters could reach. It shows you what's at stake and demonstrates the size of the challenge our heroes are about to have to overcome. When Aladdin looks up at the palace, it's easy to understand how insignificant he and everyone who isn't the royal family really is. When Mulan sees a mountain-sized army charging down at her and her few remaining comrades, you understand the kind of danger they are in. The glamour and size of the ballroom in Beauty and the Beast shows you how grand of an effect Belle has had on the Beast and how much of a change she's had on the castle, which until very recently was quite run down. But probably my favorite has to be this one right here in The Lion King when Mufasa is showing Simba the kingdom. The kingdom itself is massive and wide, but the way Mufasa is framed, he appears even larger, the true king of it all. Next to him, however, is his small cub, Simba, who, by comparison, does not look up to the task. But because he is sitting next to Mufasa, you also understand how much potential he has as well. Also, I'm just going to point this out now. They're doing this from atop a very large rock, which just so happens to be another very weird theme throughout the Disney Renaissance. Like, seriously, I don't know why, but Disney obviously felt the need for all of their characters to have a big, giant rock to go stand on, because it's in, like, every movie. Pride Rock is the best example, but B holds Gaston over one, Aladdin gets thrown off one, Pocahontas poses, Quasimodo and Herc sing, Mulan just blows one up, and Franklin rescues this lovely eagle from one. Show of hands, who actually already knew that that kid's name was Franklin? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know how I can tell you're lying? Because his name's actually Cody. In any case, the giant rocks, as random as they seem, are just another tool Disney has in their belt to demonstrate the vastness of the worlds. The bigger the world, the bigger the story, the greater the adventure, the more memorable the characters. But the real magic doesn't just come from showing you the size of the world. What Disney Renaissance movies do is bring you into the world. They let you experience it and move through it in real time. And not just by having the scene change to different locations, but literally often following behind a swinging character or sometimes a bird. These shots are all over the place and are often some of the most exciting and epic shots of the movie and are important because moving through the space is how they let you, the audience, experience the world and feel like you are truly a part of it. And these big sweeping shots also represent a, another aspect of the Disney Renaissance, which is the utilization of emerging technology, in this case, CGI. That very mentality is what put Disney animation on the map all those years ago, to be the first studio to ever make a feature-length animated film with Snow White. Throughout the Dark Age, Disney just clung to its old ways, utilizing new technology to try and accomplish old techniques 
cheaper and faster. And this is why a lot of those movies end up looking scratchy or else have a lot of really heavy black lines. The Renaissance, on the other hand, took a different approach. Rather than trying to cheapen old ways, they embraced new styles of animation. Their first big success with this actually came before the Renaissance started in The Great Mouse Detective, where they used CGI for the iconic gears inside of Big Ben. And while that was extremely effective, future movies wouldn't just experiment with CGI in single scenes. They would put it front and center in the middle of the most epic moments. The Cave of Wonders and the Escape from Within? <sighs> Nailed it. The ringing of the bells and the opening scenes of Hunchback? <sighs> Nailed it. Herc fighting the Hydra Tarzan branch surfing. I mean, these are huge iconic moments that aren't just enhanced by, but are also made possible by embracing new styles of animation. I mean, just watch this huge zoom to open the rescuers down under. I mean, seriously, the shot is so cool. It goes on forever. Okay, can I just have a brief pause to like geek out a little about the rescuers down under? Why does nobody talk about this movie? I mean, look, look at this fall right here. Look at this height. He looks so high up. And he's riding an eagle and skating on water and jumping off of a waterfall. I mean, God, this animation is awesome. And I'm not like cherry picking these from all over the movie. That's all of that is just in the first seven minutes. All right, that's enough of that. Back to cool CGI elsewhere. Let's talk about the Beast Ballroom again and his big dance with Belle because this is another great example of CGI raising this scene to new heights. Compare it, for example, to Sleeping Beauty's big dance scene. I mean, it's just a static shot of them dancing. It's boring. Even the characters are falling asleep. On the other hand, Beauty and the Beast feels magical and epic and huge. This is the moment their relationship has been building up to the whole movie. Belle is in the yellow dress. It's like, yeah! Although I will say, just to be fair to Sleeping Beauty, that later on in Beauty and the Beast, they actually take frame for frame reused animation for the final dance. Again, in front of just a really static, non-moving crowd. It's, you know. Although speaking of crowds, that is another area where CGI would vastly improve and to great effect. Like when Quasimodo swings in to save Esmeralda, or when the whole country of China bows to Mulan. These are huge moments of victory for these characters, and they're so memorable because Disney was pushing the envelope. But never do I think this was more true than in the case of the avalanche in Mulan and the stampede in The Lion King. For Mulan, they had to develop a new program called Attila so that they could autonomously animate the over 2,000 Huns on screen at once. And for The Lion King, it took them over three years to animate the stampede, and again, they had to invent new technology so that they could properly animate the dust happening in the stampede. <laughs> Oh, that glorious dust. But what brings all these movies together isn't just the style of the animation, it's also the stories and the characters themselves. Each of these movies has very similar character roles and story beats, which can make them very familiar and comfortable, if not maybe just a touch repetitive at times. For example, a vast majority of the Renaissance movies involve the main character pretending to be something they're not. Like a prince, or not a prince, or a human, or a man, or a gorilla? Or else they literally changed into something else, like a beast or a mortal, and in pretty much every case, the character's main motivation is to overcome this mistaken identity, or to be recognized for who they truly are. And doing this pretty much always involves overcoming a very over-the-top, extremely memorable Disney villain. I mean, nobody does villains like the Disney Renaissance, and like, nobody, even today's Disney villains have nothing on them. See, like, nowadays, the whole mistaken identity thing has also been extended to the villains, and the misdirect and plot twist big reveal of who it is at the end is very trendy. <gasps> oh my god, it was Professor Callahan? <gasps> oh my god, it was Assistant Mayor Bellwether? What? Not Hans! Teka? Nah, she's not a villain, she's just missing her heart. Art. See what I mean? But back then, there was no mistaking who the villains were right from the get-go. They were big and bad and huge and egotistical and awesome. I mean, just the phrase Disney villain is like its own genre of character. When I say the phrase Disney villain, who comes to mind first? Because I bet it's someone from the Renaissance. For me, it is Jafar, 
Scar, and Ursula. Not only are the Renaissance villains a rebirth of the original big bads like the Evil Witch and Maleficent, but they reinforce another theme of the Renaissance as a whole, which is the complete lack of moral ambiguity. The good guys are good and the bad guys are bad. I don't think anyone was leaving the theaters back then being like, well, you know, I, I know he was the bad guy, but I do think Scar had a point. Very different story today. I mean, I dare you to just go on YouTube and type in, was Thanos right? Speaking of the good guys though, they had their own set of pros because you had better believe that in all of these movies, there was a very attractive couple that could definitely fall in love and probably involve some royalty. Because once Disney realized how popular the princesses were, <sighs> well, they just could not use them. Sure, Nala, Esmeralda, Meg, and Jane are all just totally getting the shaft in terms of the official Disney princess branding, but they are all still very present in those movies and still act in the exact same way roles. Okay, we have big scope, new CGI, crazy fun villains, princesses, really big rocks, love, romance, royalty. What else are we missing? Um, oh, the songs. Yeah, if anything really ties these movies together more than anything else, it's the musical numbers. As I said earlier, Ron Clements and John Musker wanted The Little Mermaid to feel like a Broadway musical. And after it was successful, the idea caught on in a big way. Each movie would have its very own like style of music and stuff, but they all would hit the same categories of songs. There's your classic yearning for more song, the love song, the villain song, the showstopper, and of course, the buddy song. Not only do these songs all tend to hit the same kind of story beats, which again, helps them feel more familiar, but they are all extremely catchy and most importantly, help tell the story. These aren't just musical numbers for the sake of having a song in the movie. They help advance the plot in a fun, over-the-top way that makes the movie memorable after it's over. It can often be difficult to go see a movie over and over and over again, but do you know what's not difficult? Just listening to the music over and over and over again. And it's not even just that the movies had songs and that those songs hit similar story beats that made them feel connected. It's the fact that the same people were working on a lot of the songs in different movies. Alan Menken in particular left a big mark on the Renaissance, acting as the composer and songwriter for The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Pocahontas, Hunchback, and Hercules. God, can we just like take a second to applaud that? Like, geez. And that idea doesn't stop at the music. It also goes for directing. John Musker and Ron Clements didn't just do The Little Mermaid. They also did Aladdin and Hercules. Gary Truesdale and Kirk Wise did both Beauty and the Beast and Hunchback. And Mike Gabriel worked on both Rescuers Down Under and Pocahontas. Just between those five guys, they've covered over half of the movies in the Renaissance and all worked with Alan Menken. I mean, it's no wonder the movies all feel connected. They just, they literally are. And the result, speak for themselves. I mean, just look at these numbers. As a whole, the Renaissance earned 1.4 billion domestic and 3.3 billion worldwide. For comparison's sake, combined, all of the movies of the Dark Age did just 356 million domestic. That's less than just the Lion King. The Disney Renaissance didn't just save the animation department at Disney, it also inspired other studios to create their own animation departments to try and replicate what Disney was doing. And while mostly they were unsuccessful, there were a few gems in there, like Anastasia out of Fox or the Prince of Egypt out of DreamWorks. But if everything was going so well, you might be wondering why did it end? You could say that they just finally abandoned their class classic formula when they did The Emperor's New Groove. I mean, there's no songs, well, except for the one. I think we can all agree that's mostly just an extension of Cusco's ego more than a really big plot point. And he has no love interest either. Yeah, there's a really awesome villain and yeah, he does have a case of mistaken identity. 
llama face. But by the end of the movie, he's right back where he started, just with a different perspective on life. Cusco doesn't set out on a mission for self-discovery. He just sort of inadvertently ends up on one against his will, and it turns out better for him. And either way, whatever. I think we can all agree that The Emperor's New Groove is actually the best Disney movie of all time. All right, 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 right. You agree with me, right? Cool. But really, I don't think that's the reason. The real reason is, I think, just the new emerging technology of the day, namely fully computer animated movies. By the year 2001, Pixar had started making movies as well, and had already released Toy Story, Toy Story 2, Monsters, Inc., and A Bug's Life, and they were all crushing it. This was all before Disney owned Pixar. Not to mention DreamWorks, which was founded by Jeffrey Katzenberg, who had left Disney in the middle of the Renaissance because then-CEO Michael Eisner wouldn't promote him came out with his own full of computer animated movie, perhaps you've heard of it, Shrek also crushed it. Meanwhile, Disney had The Emperor's New Groove, The Lost City of Atlantis, and Lilo and Stitch. And while they are very much beloved movies to many, they just weren't putting up the numbers. And so Michael Eisner shut down the 2D animation department and instead said, we're going full bore with the fully computer animated stuff. Which might have been a good idea, but it just seemed like Disney did not know what they were doing in comparison to DreamWorks and Pixar. They ended up buying one of those studios, Pixar, and after 10 years of floundering with their own animation department, they finally found success with, guess what? Princesses! <laughs> Who <laughs> saw that coming? Anyway guys, that is the story of the Disney Renaissance and how even though individually each of the movies is great, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Hope you guys learned something today. This is a video I've been wanting to make forever, so thanks for sitting through the entire thing. If you want to learn even more about the Disney Renaissance, I'll include some links to some other various sources. I learned a lot making this video. Uh, you can check those out in the description down below. Ben, my question for you and everyone else is, of course, what is your favorite? favorite Disney Renaissance movie? Let me know in the towel section down below. Thanks so much for watching today's video. Please remember to leave a like on it if you haven't already and subscribe so you don't miss any future Disney action from us. If you want to see how the great mouse detective saved Disney, you can check out this video right here. Or if you want to know the history between a bug's life and ants, you can check out this video right here. But Ben, that's all I've got time for today, man. I will see you in another life, brother.